director of the American Social History Project Center for Media and Learning, and a member of the history faculty here at the Graduate Center. I'm pleased to welcome you this evening to the third program in a series of three public panels called Still Hazy After All These Years, marking the sesquicentennial, it's always hard to get that full word out, of the start of the American Civil War. Now, tonight's event is co-sponsored by, it seems like, every uh, graduate center department and research center, uh, including the PhD program in history, the PhD program in art history, the Center for the Humanities, and the American Social History Project Center for Media and Learning. Since 1981, the Social History Project has been dedicated to renewing interest in history by challenging traditional ways people learn about the past through print, visual and multimedia materials that explore the diverse history of the United States, particularly the history of working men and women. We also run seminars that help teachers use the latest scholarship, technology, and active learning methods in their classrooms. With that focus, uh, with the focus of this evening on Civil War photography, this seems an appropriate moment to announce that thanks to a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Social History Project will be hosting next July an NEH Summer Institute for University and College Teachers on the Visual Culture of the Civil War here at the Graduate Center. Uh, we welcome applications to participate in the Institute. The deadline for the submissions is a long way off in March, next March. And you'll find flyers for the information about <coughs> applying on the table outside and on our website. And we've conveniently put the URL up on the screen for you to consult. Now tonight's panel is entitled, Is There Anything More to See? Civil War Photography and History. Now few will argue, I believe, with the notion that photography and the Civil War are in inextricably linked in shaping how we have come to envision the conflict 150 years later. The myriad soldiers, statesmen, civilian and slave portraits, the views of camps, countrysides, cities, and battlefields, and the images of the aftermaths of Antietam, Gettysburg, and other battles have gained the familiarity, reinvigorated for what it's worth, by Ken Burns' 1990 public television series that links the past to the present, or at least it seems to do so. But often in iconic or even fetishistic terms that are in service to particular contemporary predilections, politics, and policy. So our question, is there anything more to see, is neither rhetorical nor merely provocative, but rather descriptive of much recent scholarship which continues to try to discern through the nostalgic and distorting fog the meaning of these images, to see them through mid-19th century eyes and delve into that historical consciousness. So each member of our panel of distinguished scholars this evening has in various ways grappled with this challenge. But before I introduce our speakers, let me provide a brief orientation to just what photography involved in the Civil War era. In other words, how did a photographer take a photograph? The cutting edge photo technology of the day was the so-called wet collodion or wet plate process, which created a single glass plate negative that could thereafter be used to produce an endless number of positive paper photographic prints. The catch was that the preparation exp and exposing and developing of that plate was a delicate procedure that had to be done on the spot and in a very short period of time. Each glass plate had to be first cleaned and then coated as evenly as possible with a so-called collodion solution composed of a number of noxious chemicals including ether and acid. Then after it dried, the, paper, the, pl the plate was immersed in a bath of silver nitrate. All of this activity was done in the darkness provided by a tent or an enclosed wagon. Then, the still, wet, the still wet plate was put in a holder and quickly inserted in an already set up camera and exposed. Then it was back to the tent or wagon where the delicate plate had to be immediately developed, fixed, rinsed, and dried. It was a process that had to be repeated over and over, each negative taking somewhere in the vicinity of 30 minutes to produce. And it was a process that required time, assistance, no interruption, control conditions, a fair amount of equipment, and a reliance on a steady supply of chemicals and glass plates. A process, in other words, not particularly suited for combat conditions. Now, combat, commenting on photography's precarious wet plate process, not to mention its slow exposure time, 
the London Times observed in 1862 that, quote, the photographer who follows in the wake of modern armies must be content with conditions of repose and with the still life which remains when the fighting is over. So, with that strenuous process in mind, let me introduce the members of our panel. Our first speaker will be Marnie Sandweiss, who is professor of history at Princeton University. She received her PhD in history from Yale University and began her career as a photography curator. Marnie has been the recipient of fellowships from the NEH, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Rockefeller Foundation, and most recently, she was a scholar in residence at the Huntington Library. Among, among many works, she is the co-editor of the Oxford History of the American West, which won uh, the Western Heritage Award and the, uh, is it Kathy? No, Kate. Coy. Coy, well, I was pretty far away from that. The Coy Western History Association Prize. Her 2002 book, Print the Legend, Photography in the American West, received the Organization of American Historians Ray Allen Billington Award for the best book in American frontier history, and the William P. Clements Award for the best nonfiction book on Southwestern America. And her 2009, Passing Strange, A Gilded Age Tale of Love and Deception Across the Color Line, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and was named one of the top 10 books of the year by the New York Times. Our second speaker will be Anthony Lee, who is professor and chair of art history at Mount Holyoke College, as well as a curator and photographer. A PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, he has been a fellow of the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson, J. Paul Getty, and Henry Luce Foundations, and the Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute. Tony is author of the 2001 Picturing Chinatown, Art and, Orient and Orientalism in San Francisco, which won the National Museum of American Arts Charles C. Eldridge Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in American Art and the Cultural Studies Book Prize given by the Association of Asian American Studies. His most recent work includes A Shoemaker's Story, which has a terrific subtitle, being chiefly about French-Canadian immigrants, enterprising ph photographers, rascal rant Yankees, and Chinese cobblers in a 19th century factory town. <laughs> Every chapter's there. And, and he is also co-author with uh, Elizabeth Young uh, on the book on Alexander Gardner's photographic sketchbook of the Civil War, both books published in 2008. Our next speaker will be Mary Neal Mitchell, who is Associate Professor of History at the University of New Orleans, a PhD from New York University. She has received fellowships and awards from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, the Gilder Lehrman Institute, the Massachusetts History Society, Historical Society, the American Studies Association, and the American Historical Association. Molly is author of Raising Freedom's Child, Black Children and Visions of the Future After Slavery, published in 2008, as well as articles and reviews on race, slavery, and emancipation in the US South and the Americas. She is currently working on a new project about race, slavery, and the Fugitive Slave Act, tentatively titled, The Real Ida May, Race, Fiction, and the Areotypes in a Story of Anti-Slavery. And our fourth speaker will be Deborah Willis, who is chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, and is also a university professor in the Africana Studies program in the College of Arts and Sciences, in addition to her noted work as a curator and exhibiting photographer. Deborah received her PhD from George Mason University and has been the recipient of Fletcher, Guggenheim, and MacArthur Foundation fellowships. And she was named one of the 100 most important people in photography by American Photography Magazine. Among her many works, Deborah is author of Picturing Us, African American Identity in Photography, and uh, another, another book, Posing Beauty, African American Images from the 1890s to the Present, and co-author of a Small Nation of People, W.B. Du Bois, and African American Portraits of Progress. Her most recent books include Michelle Obama, The First Lady in Photographs, published in 2009, and as co-editor of Black Venus, They Called Her Hot and Tot, published in 2010. So, after our panelists have spoken, this is the arrangement for tonight, we'll gather around this table and discuss some of the issues raised in their presentations, and then we'll open up the conversation and invite, and invite you to pose questions. 
So let me close, though, by thanking uh, a number of institutions and people here. Uh, first, the New York Council for the Humanities for a grant supporting this series. And I want to thank Helena Rosenblatt, the Executive Officer of the PhD Program in History, Kevin Murphy, Murphy the Executive Officer of the PhD Program in Art History, Evan Sweeney, Executive Director of the Center for the Humanities, and Anna Bozovovich, I hope I didn't mask your name, its program manager, for their help in organizing this event. And I'd like to acknowledge the critical behind the scenes work of my colleagues at the Social History Project, Donna Thompson Ray, Ellen Noonan, Leah Potter, and Leah Namias, and particularly Issa Vasquez, whose intervention made everything technical and visual possible here tonight. So, without any further ado, Marty. century American historian as we begin here to collectively think about the continuing challenges of Civil War photographs. And I want to focus on them this evening as historical documents. I think we might start by acknowledging this. It's easier to write a good history of the war with Civil War photographs than it is to write a full history from them for two reasons. First, because of the fragmentary nature of the record which I don't think we've fully grappled with. And second, because we still know so little about how these photographs functioned in their own time to shape and engage public opinion. Together, these two things mean that most historians continue to use Civil War images as illustrations, mere visual affirmation for ideas developed from other sources, that is time-bound primary source documents with the potential to illuminate more complex events. So let me speak first to the challenges posed by the unevenness of the photographic record. As William Frasinito wrote some time ago, the vast majority of campaigns during the Civil War went completely unrecorded by any photographers. Indeed, the Eastern Theater of the War and the Army of the Potomac in particular were heavily documented, while remote episodes like Sheridan's Shenandoah campaign went completely unphotographed. virtually stops after 1861. So our image of the war is one-sided. Photographs more easily let us visualize the movement of northern troops than of Confederate ones. To visualize northern officers on the battlefield, as you see here, than of their southern counterparts. Historians need to think more, I think, about the ways in which this unevenness of the record has inflected the telling of the war. dictator, for example, got an undue attention simply because we have several good photographs of it, including this one from Alexander Gardner's great photographic sketchbook of the war. It saw limited action in the siege of Petersburg and seems to have spent the final six months of the war in storage. <laughs> Conversely, might we have had different stories in our history books if historians had had, had access to this recently identified Antietam image the only known vintage print of the demolished Confederate battery near Sharpsburg, September 19, 1862, just recently located in the Taylor collection at the Huntington Library. In that same collection is a small photograph of the Battle of Antietam in progress. Can it be 
that all this time there really has been a photograph of the war that actually depicts a battle scene, albeit from a safe distance. After all these years, we've still not learned all that's out there. And the extant photographic record is spotty. That's a given here. But it's also true that historians and photo researchers have returned to the same well again and again, re reproducing pictures from the Gardner sketch sketchbook or the easily accessed collections at the Library of Congress, rather than fanning out to do some of the hard digging and detective work. But despite an intriguing image or two, the Gardner sketchbook gives us scant access to the experience of, say, African Americans during the war. This Isaac Bonsell image from Chattanooga offers so many more possibilities, but now also in the Huntington Collection, it's remained little known. The turn to the digital means has made many more images more available, more available than ever before. But despite what our students think, not all of world knowledge, not even all of the Civil War photographs, and certainly not this one, can be found with the flip of a computer key. So we must first consider which photographs out of the overall corpus of images have been used to shape our stories. We must also be attentive to how they've been used. The Civil War dead were photographed only about half a dozen times in four years. The effect of this is not so much to have presented a one-sided view of the violence, because as is well known now, photographers like Alexander Gardner, whose picture you see here, seem to have had few compunctions about using the same body to represent a Union and then a Confederate casualty. The more insidious effect has been to encourage the synodoptic use of such images, with a handful of images of war casualties standing in for hundreds of thousands more. The use of one image to represent the experience of other unphotographed people perhaps reached its apogee in Ken Burns' Civil War series, which Josh just alluded to a series in which portraits of some soldiers were used to visualize the words of others. Good drama, perhaps, but poor history. So let me just wrap up this point. The lacuna in the record, the spottiness of that record, the still uncertain scope of that record presents us with challenges. Not just the challenge of prob probing less well-known archives, but the challenge of trying to understand how the limited and biased photographic record has shaped both public memory of a complex event and the writing of scholars, making us more likely to narrate some stories at the expense of others. The study of Civil War memory, particularly since the publication of David Blight's Race and Reunion in 2001, has become something of a growth industry. But to graduate students in this room looking for a research topic, I'd say that we still have much more to understand about the how the extant and limited photographic record has shaped popular understanding of the war, directed historians to one topic at the expense of others, dictated the content of popular films and coffee table books that continue to shape social memory. My second big point this evening speaks to a different sort of opportunity for would-be scholars. We still have insufficient knowledge of how the Civil War photographs circulated in their own time and how they shaped public opinion. Countless books assert rhetorically that the Civil War is a key moment in the history of photojournalism, or war photography, or documentary photography. Perhaps. But I don't think we fully demonstrated that this is the case for all the times we've asserted it. We just do not know enough about how the pictures worked in their particular historical moment. Many, many of you will have heard or read that review from the New York Times of October 20th, 1862, about the exhibition of Gardner's photographs of the dead at Matthew Brady's studio in New York. Mr. Brady has done something to bring home to us the terrible reality and earnestness of war. If he has not brought bodies and laid them in our dooryards and along the streets, he has done something very like it. <coughs> There's a terrible fascination about it that draws one near these pictures and makes him loath to leave them. You will see hushed, reverend groups standing around these weird copies of Carnage, bending down to look in the pale faces of the dead, chained by the strange spell that dwells in dead men's eyes. Compelling prose. But I think we still have much to learn about how these pictures were received. 
We know very little about how people encountered Civil War images in stationery stores or galleries or fairs or in the privacy of their own parlors. How they even encountered or collected these photographs, even in military camps. The scholars who have been working on the history of the book, I think, have much to teach us about what we might learn by trying to probe more into publication numbers, circulation patterns, economic markets, or the response of viewers. Similarly, we still have much to learn about how Civil War photographs competed with other forms of visual imagery. Many of you may be familiar with what happened when the Civil War photographs were turned into prints in the popular press. The vivid and horrifying detail got translated into a pattern of loosely drawn lines. But how often did even this happen? My own quick survey suggests that most photographs engraved for reproduction during the war itself were portraits. There was still a broad cultural uncertainty about what photographs could do. If they seemed a sturdy and reliable study for portraits, they still seemed less useful somehow as studies for more complex events. Unlike prints, photographs could not condense action, highlight decisive or pivotal moments, easily make use of familiar symbolic vocabularies or utilize color to heighten public appeal and narrative drama. Printmakers often embellish the photographic originals to make them more narrative. And I show you here George Barnard's view of where General McPherson fell, and here the version of it that appeared in Harper's Weekly. Printmakers sometimes claim to have photographic sources when it seems uncertain they had any at all. Again, another uh, image from Harper showing General Fremont on a horse. If you can read the caption on the far right, it does note that this is from a photograph. Now, why would this printmaker claim a photographic source for this print? No photograph could have ca captured these prancing horses. But do we see here an indication of the ways in which the very claim to a photographic source might make viewers trust an image all the more. We may value the eyewitness veracity of the Civil War photographs, but it's not at all clear that viewers of the time necessarily did. So which had more appeal? This image of Gettysburg? Or this one? This print of the killing of Colonel Ellsworth and then the killing of his killer in Alexandria, Virginia in May of 1861? Or this photograph of the building where the shooting happened, the opening image of the Gardner sketchbook, and a photo photograph that needed a very lengthy caption to make apparent its narrative import. <coughs> Civil War photographs competed for public attention in a vast and complicated visual marketplace they circulated as actual physical artifacts. And there's much more to learn about how they got published, sold, and traded. How they got consulted in shops and galleries, on battlefields, in living rooms. Eventually, photography does become a tool of mass communication. But that's later, some decades after the end of the war, when the emergence of a halftone reproduction technology allows photographs to be reproduced with ease. During the war and its immediate aftermath, I'm not sure photography can fairly be characterized as a medium of mass communication. It's still competing with imaginative prints. And to study photography in isolation, without consideration of those competing images that circulated in far greater numbers, is to miss an important piece of the story. I don't have all the numbers. I don't know if anybody does. But if I had to bet, I'd wager that Americans in the 1860s and 70s spent far more money on popular lithographic prints of the war than on photographs. We might be seduced by the power of these photographic images. But as Josh just suggested, I think our widespread fascination with them may be something that has actually grown over the years since they were first produced. So for the sake of argument, I think I'll end with a provocative statement, which I hope we can address later. If this is a decisive moment in the history of American photography, I think the proof is yet to be laid out on the table. And therein lies an opportunity for many a historian. Thank you.
team which is also send my thanks to Josh Brown and to Don Array. Uh, these are events that are uh, the result of very hard work and I want to send my thanks to them. Um, my talk tonight will begin with a case study uh, from which I hope I can draw a few, I hope, provocative conclusions that might be the basis for discussion. Okay. Uh, on June 11th, 2010, the Associated Press released an astonishing story about the discovery of a rare Civil War photograph. The photograph, a small carte de visite of two young African-American boys, was found at a moving sale in Charlotte, North Carolina by a New York collector named Kia Morgan. I buy stuff all the time, Morgan reported, but this shocked me. What shocked him, he admitted, was both the rarity of the find and also the pathos of and sympathy for its subjects. These kids were, quote, abused and mistreated, and people forgot about them, he stated. They didn't even exist in history. In this interpretation, the boys' bare feet, shabby clothes, and hard, unyielding <coughs> expressions spoke volumes about their plight, one in which the institution of slavery did not discriminate between grown men and innocent children, and subjected them all, young and old, to physical and social abuse and to neglect. When Morgan stated that the boys didn't even exist in history, as he put it, he pointed to a scholarly truth in that, in contemporary discussions about the Civil War, the lives of young slaves are rarely discussed. I have never seen another photo book like that that speaks so much for children, Morgan said. AP reported that Morgan paid $30,000 for the picture and the photo album of which it was a part. The album included several family pictures, quote, though neither the name of the family nor any additional pictures from the album were released with the story. However, Morgan claimed that the album's owner might have been a descendant of one of the boys. In addition to purchasing the picture and the album, Morgan paid an additional $20,000 for an accompanying document. A bill of sale from 1854, which stated that a slave called John whose name was written large in the middle of the bill, was sold in North Carolina by a man, man named Miles Potter for the then princely sum of $1,150. Although there was no direct evidence of a connection between the photograph and the bill of sale, both Morgan and the AP story claimed that one of the children was indeed John, though it remained tantalizingly unclear which of the two boys that might be. Finally, to top off the discovery, the photograph bore the imprint of the great Civil War photographer, Matthew Brady, making the picture a trifecta in terms of Civil War finds. Um, the fact that the photograph was produced by the Brady studio drove its price up astronomically, and combined with the apparent rarity of the subject, slave children, and the accompanying document, the bill of sale, made the $50,000 price tag seem, if not within the grasp of most memorabilia hunters, at least understandable for the likes of super collectors like Morgan. For now, the AP story concluded, Morgan was keeping the photo in his personal collection, but he said, has said he has had an inquiry to sell the photo to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. A day later, on June 12, 2010, the shit, so to speak, hit the fan. <laughs> on blogs and discussion lists throughout the country, photo and Civil War historians, collectors, and journalists began to question the discovery. A reporter named Kate Marcus revealed that the Brady carte de visite was, in fact, one half of a stereo view known to have been marketed under the studio name of J.N. Wilson of Savannah, Georgia. Unlike the Brady carte de visite, the Wilson stereo view probably dated to the 1870s when the photographer was active. That is, not during the Civil War, but after it not during slavery, but after its abolishment, as other bloggers remarked. Unlike Brady, who simply used his studio name as a marker on the picture, Wilson appended on the back the title, Happy Little Nids, though it is unclear how, how ironically he meant such a title, given the stern expressions of the boys. How did the reporter Marcus learn of this stereo view? She had rummaged through that obscure website, eBay, <laughs> and found that just a few days before the AP story broke, a tw set of 12 antique stereo views, including Happy Little Nicks, you can see there at the bottom left, uh, 
uh, had been auctioned off for the modest sum of $163. The seller of that set of stereo views later admitted he had gotten the photographs in a paper bag at an estate sale in Wethersfield, Connecticut, and had paid $5 for the whole thing. <laughs> to him, the $163 for which he resold it was a nice profit. With that announcement, the floodgates were opened, and <coughs> others joined in the fray. Not only was the carte de visite not so rare a find as bloggers describe, but in fact, a copy existed in the New York Public Library and had been known about for years. It appeared, and still appears today, in the library's online catalog and can be found with a simple search for the photographer J.N. Wilson. In addition, as photo historians on another discussion list declared, the stereo view was known to have been sold under the imprint of yet another photographer, W.H. Cushing of Palatka, Florida, who around 1875, when he marketed the work, renamed the photograph Rising Generation. In this retitling of the work by Cushing, the photograph of two young black boys went from being an image of abuse and mistreatment, as told by Kim Morgan, to the patronizing or perhaps ironical happy little nids of J. N. Wilson to an image of resilience, or perhaps even defiance, uh, uh, as proposed by W. H. Cushing. In the latter case, uh, the resilience of a generation of former slaves who are rising to a more hopeful future under emancipation. More news came tumbling out. <laughs> on June 13, the reporter Kate Marcus announced that after scouring the digital library on American slavery, the slave named John on the bill of sale did in fact appear in the estate of one George Potter who in 1854 had the contents of his estate, including his slaves, sold by his son Miles. However, at the time of the sale, the slave John was 27 or 28 years old, and thus the attribution of one of the boys as John seemed quite unlikely. A week later, a Civil War memorabilia collector named Bruce Barilla identified the stereo view as belonging to a set of views published by J.N. Wilson concerning Ag News, Turpentine Factory in Silver Springs Run, Florida. That is to say, not North Carolina, where Brady's Carte de Visite was discovered, uh, nor Savannah, Georgia, where J. Ann Wilson kept his studio, but even further south near what is today Ocala, Florida. The location helped to explain how W. H. Cushing of Palatka, Florida, could have gotten his hands on a copy and remarketed under his own studio name. Barilla noted the appearance of the barrels as a common theme in all the photographs of the turpentine factory and in its careful registration of slave life in that factory. Ag News was in operation during the Civil War and according to the 1860s slave schedule, had 26 male slaves, almost half of whom were under the age of 16. Brady was known to have solicited copy negatives and prints from all over the South, bloggers reminded each other, including Florida. What Kia Morgan thought of all this new information or the people peddling it is not entirely clear. Though he stood by his claims and certainly by the price he had paid, in reply to the various revelations about the photograph, he declared in a follow-up story carried by the Associated Press, if you were buying a Picasso painting, let's say for 20 million, you have to go to a professional who sells Picassos for an expert <laughs> painting, not somebody who sells a copy for $10 on eBay. Despite Morgan's insistence on the value of his carte de visite, it was clear to most observers within a week of the original story being released that the photograph's luster had been severely tarnished. <coughs> a blogger put the verdict this way. The boy was not a slave, and his name was not John, and he was not from North Carolina, and the photo was not rare. <laughs> now, I don't wish to lay a similar verdict on the photograph, and certainly don't wish to caricature any of the participants involved in the discovery and interpretation of the picture, or to make light of their investments, whether intellectual, financial, or cultural. As for the photograph itself, it's incredibly difficult to say how it, as either a stereo view or a carte de visite, circulated between and among studios, and which photographer of the several who have been named might have been its original maker. Perhaps none of them were. Or perhaps there is another version by yet another photographer waiting to be discovered, though it's difficult to imagine how a fourth or fifth variation of the picture would settle the matter of origins. But I think the photograph and the debate has, as it has spawned provide some instruction about the kinds of things for us to see in Civil War photographs. 
uh, subject of our panel this evening. The first thing to say is that photographs from the Civil War era really do continue to impact our perception of that time. Although we know photographs then and now are subject to manipulation and the conditions of their presentation and distribution, we often still want to see what is pictured as the authentic thing. The collector Kia Morgan saw the picture as evidence of abuse and neglect, and the boys as representative of a lost generation of slaves. It was only the photograph that gave them visibility. Otherwise, they were lost to history. They don't even exist in history, as he put it. Others saw it as a simple reflection of slave life, where boys on barrels helped tell the story of the doings of a turpentine factory and run on the backs of slave labor. And still others saw it as no image of slavery at all, but rather of emancipation, since it may have been produced during Reconstruction or after, and therefore fell outside the legally sanctioned institution of slavery. Despite the common belief that photographs are careful representations, not mere reflections, Civil War era photographs often seem to elicit the exact opposite attitude. The second thing to say is that if we accept that photographs are not mere reflections, but indeed representations, then the picture of the two boys is of a particular sort very common to the Civil War era. It is not at all surprising that the photograph, whenever it may have first been made, appeared popularly as a stereo view in the years after the Civil War. Already in 1866, there appeared collections of photographs that began to wax nostalgic about a Southern culture already being lost, the Old South, as it was soon called. Plantation scenes of all sorts were packaged together and sold as scenes of daily life that had been wiped away. J. N. Wilson certainly published his share of them, of people who had worked on farms, in the cotton fields, and quite often of children who posed seemingly in the middle of work before the camera. They were, as Molly Mitchell, one of our panelists this evening, has written, images of a newly freed black population that tied them to an unthreatening past. That is to say, Civil War era photography already had strong elements of nostalgia as part of its language. The third thing to say, and here's where I'll modulate into an interpretation of sorts, is that this sense of nostalgia, or of loss, was a palpable force from the very beginning especially with subjects related to the war itself. Partly, this was the result of camera technology. 